What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. We're approaching the end of 2023 and I thought it would be fitting to do an episode talking about all of my cars. I haven't done one of these episodes before, so stay tuned as we go through each car individual. We talk about my favorite things about each one. All right, so I think we'll start with the BMW 700. If you guys have been here since day one, this is a car I had when I started the YouTube channel, but it was in numerous pieces. So this is a 1960 German market BMW 700 Sport Coupe. This specific car was on the streets of Germany when it was first built. So this was privately imported to America at some point. Uh, and if you don't know the full build of this car or know the story, I do have an episode a few years back on the channel uh, you can watch the whole crazy story of my father and I extricating this out of the woods, out of a backyard with hundreds of BMWs, Porsches, and Volkswagens. So go check that out. I'll actually link it in the video's description below. This ended up as a parts car. It was in an accident at some point. Uh, the motor was pulled out of it and it sat in the woods for over 40 years in Northern New Hampshire. And it was owned by a gentleman who I ended up becoming friends with, who was kind of known in the area as like this urban legend. It was this old guy that lived in a little mobile home, had a little cinder block garage next to his, his house, and he'd worked on BMWs, Porsches, and Volkswagens his whole life, and he had hundreds littering his property. We kind of struck up a friendship. I never wanted anything from him. I just loved hearing him tell stories. So he never answered the phone. You had to drive an hour north from where I was from, and if he was outside and you showed up and he was having a good day, he'd tell you some stories. I was obsessed with the whole idea that he even had this thing, and came back a few days later, and I said, listen, I want to put it back on the road can we work out a deal? And my deal to you is I will drive it here under its own power when it's done. And the thing had trees growing inside it. There was nothing left of the floors. This was a unibody car, so there was nothing left of the floors. He almost looked at me like I had two heads because I wanted to put this sack of rusted metal back on the road again. So we worked out a deal. He essentially gave it to me, like essentially gave it to me. I gave him some money because I wanted to make sure that one, he was compensated, but two, that we could lock this in. So. 1960 German BMW 700 Sport Coupe. It's on a shortened Volkswagen Beetle chassis. It's on an IRS ball joint front Beetle pan. My father and I shortened this by almost 13 inches to meet the wheelbase of the 700. It's got a 1600 dual port motor in it now. This was originally a two cylinder air cooled rear engine car from the factory. It is heralded as the car that saved BMW from bankruptcy. The 507 and other cars that they had designed and manufactured in the 1950s basically tanked them. The Isetta, Isetta 600, and the BMW 700 all helped save BMW, which is why we see them around today, even though they're making questionable design decisions. That's not for me to argue though. So this is one of my favorite cars in the fleet because my father and I built it together. My father did a far better job than I did keeping track of the hours we had into it, and he had calculated 850 hours. But we had to build a tube chassis inside the body to basically give the body rigidity again. There was nothing left of this thing. We had to ratchet strap the body together to keep it from falling apart when we pulled it out of the woods. The episode's really cool because we have a lot of video and photo footage of us pulling it out of the woods. We had to move a whole bunch of cars on his property to just get to this car. Um, and I did, I drove it, drove it to him. I drove it an hour up to his place and Corey was actually with me when we did it. Uh, and our good friend Steve was also with us and he couldn't believe it. You almost never saw this guy smile. Uh, and he was grinning ear to ear when we showed up in this thing, driving down the road with a license plate on it. So they're super, super rare. This is a first year. The Sport Coupe is even more rare because this was a two carbureted car originally from the factory. Uh, had cooling fins on the transmission case, which was still in the car. So that also made it a Sport Coupe essentially. Other cool points of this car that were kind of struggles in the design process or the fabrication process were the wheels. My father and I actually cut the centers of the Beetle wheels out and moved them out to create a higher offset re-welded them up and used his wheel balancer as a truing stand to center the wheels. We didn't tub the rear end and the track width of the Beetle was so wide that we couldn't get the tires underneath the body when it aired down. We narrowed the front beam by a couple inches, but we also cut the centers out of those wheels. So if you're a wheel spec nerd, essentially the front wheels are 15 by four plus 68, I think. And the rears ended up being 15 by five and a half plus 64. 
I think was the overall offsets of these wheels. So it's pretty crazy. They've got 165 40s uh, all around. They're 15s. Um, but yeah, very, very cool car. Uh, one of a kind, really. This kid, Reese, I know in England, did a red saloon on a Beetle Pan a couple years after we finished this one. The saloons had a longer roof and a bigger side window that didn't pop out. And that kind of resembled the 2002 and the 1600 that they essentially successored from this car. All right, next up, the current daily driver. The 2000 W210 Mercedes E320. So this car, Corey and I just finished bagging, like literally last episode, this car was in pieces uh, with the help of bag riders, Commonwealth, and ECS tuning. We got this thing on air. We got the BC Forged MLEs on it, thanks to my friend Dan from BC Forged. This thing turned into such a cool daily driver. I bought it simply because of its condition. I'm not a huge 210 chassis fan. Uh, I like the saloons the most, I think, more so than the coupes or the wagons. I like the saloon four doors most, and I like that they came in obsidian black. So it's got like this real cool metal flake black to it. A little over 200,000 miles on it, but it's been a Georgia car its whole life. It's been kept indoors and it's been maintained by a Mercedes dealership its whole life. So this thing has been taken care of with all OEM parts. It's got a great history to it and it's rust free. So I'm from New Hampshire. We know what these cars normally look like when they're subjected to the salt. This thing is a brand new car, like basically brand new. What are we doing? So this E320 is the M112 V6. An E55 AMG would have been really cool, but also an OM606 turbo diesel would have been really cool. But the M112 is a great motor. The V6 does sound pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. Sat down on air on the MLEs. This thing is so tough looking. 18 by nine and a half up front, 18 by 10 in the rear, two 1540s all around. The car's sick. I'm so stoked on this thing. It's been bagged for two days. This is the second day I've had it on the road and it's, it's so cool to see it sitting out here, not stock. Not sure what the plan is. I'm gonna daily it for a while. I have got no reason to sell it right now. Um, it keeps me from having to daily the truck. I'm just stoked to have like a really nice daily. It's comfortable to be in. It's so far, it's been pretty reliable. It's been very reliable. I'm real happy with this car. I plan on keeping it for a while. Unless one of you guys just can't live without it and you hit me up. Yeah, right now the plan is to keep this for a while and daily it, and I'm just stoked that it looks really cool. All right, next up is the workhorse of the fleet. And I mean workhorse. <laughs> you guys have seen the last few months, I've had two cars behind this thing more than I've had one, and it's on my single car trailer, no less. So this is obviously an OBS Ford. It's an aero nose OBS, which is the facelift of the OBS. The pre-facelift was the brick nose. This is an F-250, two wheel drive, extended cab, long box. So it's got the eight foot bed. My trucks only really saw the pavement hauling cars. So having a two wheel drive truck was really what I was looking for because I wasn't pushing four wheel drive components down the road. Don't have to worry about U-joints up front and just all that stuff. So it's a two wheel drive. This may be a project on the channel here pretty soon. I really have been fighting the urge to lower it do onboard air in the back, really go through the whole thing, put onboard air. But this truck was ordered fully optioned in 1995. So this is a power stroke. It's a direct injected 7.3 international turbo diesel. My dually four door I had before this was a 93 with the IDI with a Handshaker ZF5 in it. This has the E40D automatic transmission, which I really didn't like at all at first. But when you're hauling a trailer and you're stuck in traffic and you're just inching along, it's real nice on your left hip, your left foot. You're not running that heavy clutch in and out. Obvious cool features right away is that it's not fleet white. It's green, it's like a bluish green. I'm colorblind, so I thought this was blue for the longest time. I think it's a really cool color because you don't see OBSs in this color that often. This truck came out of Alabama and it is as rust-free as the 210. It's as rust-free as it came from the factory. Again, if you're from the Northeast, you know that just like those 210s, the OBSs are rot boxes. Rockers are gone, bottoms of the doors are gone, cab corners are gone, bed rails, all that stuff. This truck is solid. I mean, take a look. Take a look at the cab. Let's just admire the cab corners for a second here. It's unbelievable how solid this truck is. Bought it off of some kid in Alabama off Marketplace. He had it for a song and it had been listed for like 30 minutes by the time I said, I'll be there tomorrow to come get it. And he couldn't believe I was coming with cash the next day to get it. This was a great purchase. I did lights all around, all new lenses all the way around. I did the eight by 10 gooseneck tow mirrors on it. So this normally had the small rectangle uh, mirror, but just like on my dually I had before this, I decided to go with the OEM gooseneck mirrors 
because it gets you a one by one ratio on the passenger side as well. So when you're towing a long trailer, you can kind of see where the end of your trailer is. And I know Corey knows, Corey knows where I'm going with this. The OEM eight by 10 mirrors have this little Ford stamp on them. And you can buy these mirrors brand new for, for pretty cheap, but they don't have the Ford stamp on them. The, the, the identical mirror, no Ford stamp. But what's really cool, and this is where I dove down the detail rabbit hole, is although they're symmetrical, you can run this mirror on the passenger side because this will flip all the way up and you can turn it upside down and run it over there. The Ford emblem would then be upside down on the passenger side. So what I did was I made sure, because the first pair I bought were the same side, is I made sure I found a passenger side OEM mirror so the Ford emblems were right side up on both sides. Now, no one will probably ever notice. So interior, super clean, not a crack in the dash. Check this out. Unbroken. Everything works. Even the coin holder is still in there. AC is ice cold, heat is super hot. Everything works. It's an XLT, fully optioned, but what's really cool is 1995. Now, if you're a Ford guy, you might correct me on this, but I'm pretty sure 1995 was the first year they offered keyless entry. And this was a baller move in 95, and it still works. It still, to this day, so cool. The fact that this has stayed with the truck its whole life and still works. This truck has been a true workhorse, 12 hours each way to Philly with two cars on the single car trailer, 12 hours to and from Fort Myers, Florida for Eurotripper, numerous Daytona rod run, runs. Yeah, good truck, OBS Ford, I'm into it. Okay, one of the most recent additions to the stable, aside from the 210 Mercedes, is the 64 Beetle. Started its life, apparently in Oklahoma, ended up in Florida, rot free. It's got some rust here and there. It's got some little bit of rust. But as you can see, the majority of it is Southern Patina. And that's what we like here. The Patina is just so good on this car. This here is going to be the next Ludwig's Garage giveaway car. That was the plan before I even picked it up. My friend Will in Florida owned this car before me and we worked out a deal for another car that I still have here that we'll talk about here very shortly. After the Porsche 924S giveaway, I really wanted to get into another car giveaway for you guys more along the lines of the stuff that I'm really into and that's old cars quirky cars with patina so that's what we're going to do with this I'm super excited to be working with Everesto in England but they're currently building a narrowed beam for it we're going to do a shock towered six inch narrowed beam we're going to do spring plates in the rear um, it's going to be adjustable so you'll be able to put it wherever you want it but we are going to put it as low as possible. The front wings aren't original. These came off a 51 Beetle. So the cool thing about the 64 small window car, last year of the small windows. So in 65, they enlarged all the windows all the way around. So this has that vintage Beetle look to it with the real small windows all the way around. I think that's the coolest part of this car aside from how nature has painted it for us. I can't wait to put this thing on the ground. Pop out windows, interior is super cool. I guess the seats are from a different year car, but it's a red interior 64. This thing is so sick. I love the weathered, torn look. I, I just, I can't get over it. I kind of have no interest in ever fully restoring a car. I really don't. Uh, I just, I don't know what it is. I'm a patina nerd. This is just, this is so cool that the sun and the elements and air temperatures have just weathered this car into a one of a kind car. No two Beetles have ever patinaed the same. Keep an eye out on the channel because I'm gonna have a lot more news about this giveaway coming early 2024. It's really gonna be our next focus. All right, so we're gonna side tangent real quick. We'll talk about the trailers because that's part of the stable too, right? So the most recent trailer purchase was this 24 foot open dual axle trailer. Uh, it's got twin 3,500 axles, but I bought a 24 foot trailer. It's a single car 24 foot, but it's become a two car trailer on more than one occasion. So this was, this was a big purchase for me when I first moved down here to Tennessee because I only had my other trailer when I first moved here and having an open trailer with a winch mount on it was key. So I'm super grateful to have this in the fleet. This thing gets used all the time. And we'll talk about the next trailer because this was my first trailer I ever bought. I ordered it basically, so it's brand new. Both these trailers are brand new. This is a 24 foot Venos twin 3,500 pound axle trailer. It's steel, so it is kind of heavy. I did not have aluminum enclosed car trailer money, but what's inside this currently is the car I traded for the 64 Beetle. Oh boy, I got a lot of stuff in here. But inside is a 1960 Auto Union 1000 SP. 
there's only about 10 to 12 known to exist in all of America, and that's one of them. And here's another one. So those are the trailers, and that's one of the 1,000 SPs that are on this piece of property. This is the other one. Now, this is a 1960 Auto Union 1000 SP. This is an American market model, believe it or not. They were available in America. The one that's in the trailer is a German market car with a kilometer cluster, privately imported back in like 1965. Crazy story. This one, um, I picked up in Ohio. It lived most of its life in North Carolina, I guess, but it was very rotted. The body was rotted pretty badly. It's a frame car. This car originally was a front-engined, three-cylinder, two-stroke, front-wheel drive car. This car, however, will not remain that. I would have loved to have kept it that, but since the body was so rotted, it was worth doing something wild to, and that thing that we decided to do was put it on a Volkswagen Beetle chassis, much like the 700, uh, and body drop it on air suspension. It's a big world out there. I'm pretty confident in saying that this will be the first 1000 SP Auto Union body dropped on air, and especially on a Beetle pan but we're rear engine swapping it. Um, as you guys saw a couple episodes ago, we just picked up the motor for this. We're gonna run a type three motor because of our overall hood clearance, or what used to be the trunk clearance. Bizarre car, guys. I mean, so bizarre. It's 1960, same year as the 700, and they're both Fintail German cars. So we've got a Fintail here, 1960 BMW, and Fintail pre-Audi Auto Union. What a wild car. So this thing is going to be a full-blown project, it already is, um, just with the cutting and we had to shorten the pan. The pan's been shortened by two inches to meet the wheelbase of the body. We've got the motor now, so now we can focus more on fabrication. We've got to build a chassis inside the body to then be able to mount it to the beetle pan. My plan is just to hopefully have this thing done for Alpine Volksfair in Helen, Georgia in May. We'll get about four months, so Corey and I are gonna be hammering on this thing after we get the beetle sorted out. So this will be the main project you'll see a lot of content on in the first few months of 2024 moving forward. Big time project, but this thing's gonna look so crazy on the ground. It's incredibly rare. It's so crazy that it still has all this stuff. The two-stroke oil cap, fuel cap, fuel and oil cap, <laughs> still has the 1000 SP badge. Like, I mean, this could have just been bumped into and broken, much like the coupe badge on the 700. Still has the Audi logo. Quick little piece of history. Auto Union was built up of four companies, and that's what the four rings signified. And Volkswagen bought Auto Union from Mercedes-Benz in 1969 diluted all the companies and turned it into Audi and kept the four ring logo. So Auto Union is pre-Audi and the four ring logo was originally Auto Union before Audi. And some of you early Audi nerds will probably know the first Audis that we saw, like the C1 100, were front wheel drive, longitude mounted with inboard front brakes. And Auto Union started all that. So when Volkswagen bought Auto Union, they were kind of already using the Auto Union designs into the early Audis, which were that longitude mounted, water-cooled front wheel drive cars. It feels so cool to be on like the, the precipice of doing something for the first time. You know, to see this thing laid out on the ground, on its body, get hyped, because we're gonna be working on this thing. Hopefully we'll be making big strides in progress on this thing in the upcoming months. All right, I'd say last car, uh, but there's a few left in New Hampshire. Last vehicle that's here is the car I've owned the longest. And you guys have just seen a full build episode on this car, so I won't talk you guys to death on this. Jump back like three or four episodes to watch the full build video. Sitting on footage of my dad and I building this car 10 years ago in 2013. This month, December of 2013, I finally put together a full build video and talked to you guys all about this car. We chopped the roof, we cut the roof clean off of the thing after it sat for over 40 years in Massachusetts. It sat on the pavement, so it didn't rot out completely. All the rust that it did have, we were able to fix. It's structurally sound. If it had sat on the grass or the dirt all those years, it would have been nothing left to it. Parked in 1973, it's a 65 Corvair. This is the first year of the late model Corvair. It's hard to believe that it was only on the road for about eight years before it was parked. Left forgotten and the owner of it was going to literally crush it at the end of the week when I came to look at it if I didn't buy it. So we quite literally saved it from the crusher. I was originally interested in this car because it's a four-speed manual, but then realized the car was so solid that it was worth putting back on the road again. Now this was the first like patina project I ever had. This is what really got the ball rolling or really kind of scratched that itch I didn't realize I had for patinaed cars. Two-inch roof chop, two different Corvair roofs, 
We got one off of a Corvair in a junkyard that had comparable rust to the Corvair itself. We ultimately had to stretch the roof, which is why we have two roofs, so we could keep our arches and body lines and rain gutters and all that stuff. Uh, we body dropped it. We custom built the front cross member, control arms, tension rods, all that's custom. I go into detail with photos and videos on the build video. This car has been all over the place. I've driven it halfway across America for car shows. Uh, I've trailered it even further than that. It's been in a handful of magazines, including Forged Magazine from Australia, which is crazy. Who would have thought people that drove by this car every single day in Massachusetts uh, just seen it weather away for decades and decades, and now it's one of my prized possessions. The license plate, the best license plate for a Corvair ever. And if you don't know why, unsafe is the best license plate for a Corvair ever. That's because in the 1960s, a guy named Ralph Nader published a book titled Unsafe at Any Speed. And the first chapter of that book was basically saying how unsafe the Chevrolet Corvair was and that it was indeed unsafe at any speed. So unsafe has found its way onto this car, not just because it's a Corvair, but because to the unknown younger generation kids, they think it's funny because the car looks unsafe. But then it allows me to kind of tell them that story and be like, there's a reason why that plate's on there. And if you don't know anything about Corvairs, they are rear engine, flat six, air-cooled. So that's kind of why I like Corvairs, naturally. It's an American car, but it's got Euro bloodline in it. Chevrolet was trying to compete with the Beatles in the 356 Porsches back in the 60s because they were killing it in the American market. All right, guys, well, that's a look at what's in the stable right now. First of all, look at how good the back of this car looks. <laughs> or ugly, if you really don't like it. I, this thing is gonna look so nuts on the ground. So that's a look at my cars and what's currently in the shop for projects. Feeling super grateful at the end of 2020. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining us for all of this year. The channel has experienced so much growth here in 2023 and I can't thank you guys enough. All of you who have jumped on board on the Patreon as well. Beyond words, I'm thankful for you guys. There's a link to the Patreon in the video's description below. If you wanna help support the channel and the shop in a greater way, your support means so much to me. I can't wait to see where the channel goes in 2024 and where these projects go. There's been projects that have come and gone already this year and I'm just like a dude. Like I'm not like a shop that builds cars or works on cars for other people. 11 countries in 2023, might try to ship a car overseas next year, who knows? Might be working on some projects with some friends that might be pretty crazy. So thank you guys so much for all of your support. If you haven't yet, please hit the subscribe button. It helps the channel and the shop in a massive way. We'll see you in the next episode. We've got one more this year, one more to close the year out. We're gonna do a year in review of the entire crazy year we just had. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you in the next episode.